Magic is drama, and drama is magic. Magic is a, a dramatic spiritual art form. And since prehistoric times, magic has been done through the agency of drama. And we see dramatic effects written and drawn all over cave walls and etched into bones and strange extinct prehistoric animals. We've been doing this stuff for a long time. I was raised in Nebraska, speaking of prehistoric. <laughs> and if it hadn't have been for my local theater, I would have been a mass murderer. <laughs> Twice a week, I would go. They'd change the movie every, every Saturday and every, and, or every Sunday, so I'd get to see two movies. Sometimes I'd see them three or four times. And I didn't care what the movie was. I'd see old strange black and white things and, uh, and comedies and B films, and I, I didn't care. It took me someplace else. It put me in contact, first of all, with my own imagination. But secondly, it put me in contact with the gods. And not just the, the, the mythological movies that actually had gods. Hi, I'm Zeus, you know. But the gods of archetypal agencies in the universe. I could see beautiful women. I could see handsome men. I could see handsome men with beautiful women. It ignited my libido. It charged my imagination. It was everything religion should be. It gave me inspiration. It gave me at least the hope of illumination. Drama is magic. And dramatic ritual has been institutionalized since prehistoric time. But there was one famous dramatic magical institution that dominated Greece for a couple of thousand years. That's a big, I mean, cats only ran how long? You know, that's, uh, <laughs> and that's the rites of Eloises, or Eleusis, or Elois. I don't know how you pronounce it any way you want. There is no correct pronunciation. You are free. And it started as an agricultural thing. Actually, it remained as an agricultural thing. Uh, does anybody here belong to the Grange or have parents or grandparents that were members of the Grange? Okay, they had dances down at the Grange Hall. You had pancake feeds down at the Grange Hall. You had, and on, uh, you, what you don't know is on Tuesday night, they had an all nude uh, pancake feed. No, they died. I'm, well, maybe they did. Maybe I'm giving away something. They hold as their, their, their mythological um, uh, tradition the, the worship of the goddess Ceres or Demeter. And I've, I've, I've looked at the, the, the rituals the, the, of the Grange, and they are overtly pagan, okay? And it is so cool to think of people chewing tobacco and plucking chickens and being so pagany. It's like right out of one of those Lovecraft B movies where... <laughs> 
everybody looks real normal, but you know, they got an octopus in the, you know. <laughs> Well, this, the, the Grange is an attempt, uh, uh, mostly a 19th century attempt, to kind of recreate what this, this Rites of Eleusis thing was about. And uh, the, the idea was to affect a change in consciousness in the members. Okay. Uh, at first, there was a class of individuals that really were aware of the phenomena accompanying the obliquity of the Earth's axis and the causes of seasons and uh, the, the idea of uh, the, 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 the mysteries of agriculture, when things get planted, when, how long they, they stay, what kind of water they need, what, what months they need to to stay under the earth what what you know but they needed an entire culture to cooperate with the organized uh, cultivation of all of this stuff and all of those people didn't need to know all of the the, the high-tech information they just needed to have a calendar to tell them when to do this Okay, and and some kind of a general reason to to perform the the, the duties that uh, that they needed to do to sustain a full blown organized agricultural state, and in Greece there started to form a cult of Ceres or or Demeter in the town of Eleusis. And the goddess Demeter was worshipped there. They eventually built a citadel. <laughs> Sounds so cool. They built a citadel on the plains of Eleusis. Okay. And that's where Demeter was, was worshipped. And her daughter was also worshipped. Uh, Persephone. And there was a story that had been so popular for a couple thousand years before that about the goddess Isis coming from, coming from uh, Egypt. And Isis had her husband, Osiris. And they were a team it was sort of like Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. Okay. <laughs> Only immortal. <laughs> and according to tradition, they took Egypt out of uh, the Dark Ages. I mean, really Dark Ages, where people ate dirt and ate each other. Okay. And didn't talk. Okay, I mean, who would you want to have a conversation with? Yeah. And supposedly they taught them how to talk. They taught them how to, to, uh, to read and write. And they taught them how to stop eating dirt and planting things in it. Then they said, stop eating each other. It's bad for population. Okay. Isis and Osiris brought Egypt in just a couple of generations, according to the, the mythology, out of the Stone Age and into an organized culture. And the story goes, well, Osiris had a, had a brother who was uh, sort of a twin brother who was um, uh, jealous of his uh, um, popularity and um, Oh, when they had an election, uh, his brother said, uh, oh, he rigged the election in Florida and made sure that he got... Uh, uh, there, was, there was hard feelings all around, okay? And uh, um, his, uh, his twin brother said, uh, well, uh, Osiris and, and Isis were, were out uh, visiting another country, sort of on a campaign 
to her. Uh, he secretly had Osiris's uh, measurements taken. I don't know how he did it. He had a had a tailor or something with measuring tape and said, "Hey, look over there." <laughs> and um, but he, he secretly had his measurements taken. Then he had a box made that that was like a vacuum form uh, box that perfectly fit Osiris. And then when Osiris got back from his his trip, he threw a big party for him and said, hey, look at this cool box that I made, and I'll give it to anybody who can fit inside it. And people tried to fit inside it, and it was too big for one person, too small for another, but Osiris, in, it, in what can only be described as divine folly, said, I'll try it. And, <laughs> and he gets in, and it fits perfectly, and he goes, Hey, this fits perfectly, but he couldn't even finish the word because they slammed the lid shut and nailed it, to, nailed it shut and, and uh, sent it off down the Nile. He was assassinated, dead. And the story goes on about how he was uh, magically brought back from life by his wife, Os uh, Isis. And she had to go through all sorts of, all sorts of uh, adventures to do this. But mostly she went to another country, Byblos, where the coffin had stopped. And, and in order for her to get the, the, the coffin where it stopped in the river, plants grew up around it and a tree grew around it. And because he was a god, the, the tree smelled really good. Okay. It was a long time ago, so I think it was like English leather. Okay. <laughs> And it smelled so good that the king put it as a, as a pillar in, in his uh, uh, own palace. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think about a god smelling really good in a big, long, pointy thing that was strong and hard and could hold up a palace and it being a representative of a god. Or, is it, or do I just have a dirty mind? <laughs> but anyway, Isis gets a job at the, at the palace. Okay, she forges her papers. She's got a green card or something. And she, she forges some papers and gets a job working for the, as a babysitter for the king. And she, she, uh, 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 starts to nurse the, the baby of the, of the king and queen. And uh, because she's a goddess, she doesn't even need to warm up a bottle. She just sticks her finger in their mouth and they go, mm, you know. And there's, there's all these little tiny stories. They're cute little vignettes of stories about how she tries to make the, the children immortal and stuff. But the, 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 the gist of the story is she ends up getting her husband back. And, and magically raising him from the dead. Not only that, but it really gets kind of sexy that uh, she's bringing him back on a barge and uh, she can't wait to, well, anyway. Uh, he impregnates her from the dead. She becomes pregnant and has the famous twins, Horus. Okay. Now, that myth, or variations on that myth, was really, really um, uh, popular, and it dominated Egyptian uh, society for a couple of thousand years. And not only that, but it helped with the timing of the festivals around this story. It helped the Egyptians know when to plant and when to do things. And those festivals were, were all uh, uh, based around the timing of the inundation of the Nile, where, where all of that fertile, um, fertile land coming up from the south uh, is deposited in that delta to area and stuff. So it was particular to, the, to Egypt. 
and everybody knew about ISIS, and there, 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 was a, there was a mystery cult around ISIS, and it was, it was uh, not so much a religion, but like a lodge, okay? a mystery school. And, uh, but it migrated up to Greece, and ha things had to change. It had to be tweaked for the weather and the, the conditions for, for Greece. They're no longer working with the inundation of the Nile and all of this. And so the Demeter and Persephone uh, uh, stories were just a, sort of a tweak of the Isis Osiris stories. Does that make sense? That's why there's, everything is so, uh, uh, so similar. But it really caught on. I mean, it really caught on. And it started to be a true institution of the worship of the earth as the goddess Demeter. And people started to come from all over to become initiates in the Eleusinian Mysteries, the Rites of Demeter. They enjoyed it, and it was secret. It was so secret that we really don't know for sure what went on exactly. I mean, nobody that went through it felt like talking about it. And supposedly, everybody who went through it never feared death again. 